Lordy, lordy, buzz killers. It's the professor here, and I am just totally stoked because Dr. Megan Kate Nelson is on the show to talk about her fantastic book, Saving Yellowstone. And again, this is one of these hugely eye opening books that really changed the way I think about American history, but also the way I think about the process of writing history and the way history is constructed. But before I keep talking about that and keep talking about me and 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 my awakening let me introduce dr nelson thank you much for coming so much for coming on the show well thank you so much for inviting me joe so glad to be here it's great to have you on here i don't think we've had a pulitzer prize finalist on the show dr nelson's three-cornered war was up you were for the pulitzer prize weren't you well, yes, no, that Sorry. that that is definitely true. Listeners, if you could have seen me, I was going really. I had that kind of facial expression of like, but wait, surely there must have been other people who have been finalists or prize winners uh, on your show. I don't think so. Yes. Your three cornered war was a finalist, and it's, it's a very important book. And we should have in yes. invited you on the show about that, but we didn't. But we're here to talk about Yellowstone, saving Yellowstone. It's such an important book, and as we were talking about before we started recording. Like most Americans, I thought of Yellowstone Park as and national parks in general, just sort of the sort of given like, you know, yes, of course, they thought it was a good idea. It was preserving nature and all that sort of stuff as a 19th century thing about beauty. But you show so much more about how this process started. The book is called Exploration and Preservation and Reconstruction America. So it starts in Reconstruction. And before one more thing before we get rolling, I want to have a shout out to one of our Patreon supporters, Liz Kennan, who is a member of Buzzkill Society through Patreon and is perhaps the most outdoorsy member of Buzzkill Society. So thanks, Liz. This show is is sponsored by you, supported by you, and I think you 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 will love reading uh, Saving Yellowstone. But again, I've done it again. I'm talking too much. You're the expert. You're the star, Dr. <laughs> Nelson. Please, can we address this question of first national parks and Yellowstone in particular is a sort of a given, a sort of an obvious thing to do. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, this is this is one of the things that really surprised me too when I started researching. I think because Americans, you know, we really do just sort of assume, I mean, national parks have been around for so long. They're really agreed upon, I think, as a as a public good, as a democratic space, although they are not really, mm -hmm. which is something we could talk about later also. And, you know, even people with the most profound political disagreements can agree that a place like Yellowstone is just sublime and amazing and wonderful, right? We can bond over that at least. We have that in common. And so I think, you know, it's natural to think, well, you know, they just passed the Yellowstone Act in 1872. Of course they did. And most histories, actually, of Yellowstone, if they're a kind of long durée history of the place and then the park, really don't delve into the fight about the Yellowstone Act at all or the debates or why people would have said, you know what, that doesn't seem like such a great idea. Mm -hmm. um, so that was a really interesting part of the research for me. Yellowstone is the first one, obviously. We know that. But th but then does this continue continue to be a contentious thing? Or do, as, as the decades roll on, is it easier to make national mm -hmm. parks or is it always this sort of uh, difficulty, which we'll get into the details in a minute? Yeah, there. I mean, so there was a precedent in, well, first there was Arkansas Hot Springs, which was set aside as a reservation uh -huh. in 1832 by Andrew Jackson. But that was kind of its own thing, and no one really knew what to do, and it didn't really have much federal oversight. Then the Yosemite Act gets passed during the Civil War of all times, mm -hmm. but that act gave Yosemite and Mariposa Grove to the state of California to manage. Right. So Yellowstone was precedent setting because it was the first act that actually took land from territories and from indigenous peoples and gave it to the federal government to manage for the benefit of the people, took it out of development entirely. So that's why it was such a kind of profound moment and why this had not ever happened before. And it was that precedent. But what's interesting is until 1890, absolutely nothing happened. Congress did not create any more parks. Mm. There was a little spate of, of park creation in 1890 under Benjamin Harrison. Yosemite became a national park at that point, Sequoia. But it really took Teddy Roosevelt in the early 20th century 
to light a fire under Mm -hmm. (laughs) congressional politicians. And really, not only did they create five new national parks during his presidency, but they also passed the 1906 Antiquities Act, which made it possible for Roosevelt and any president after that to create national monuments, national historic parks, national battlefield parks, all those other kinds of, of areas that are under the National Park Service now, but are slightly different from national parks in their categorization. It was a precedent, but it really didn't do much for yeah. for a, a fairly long time. Yes, well, 30 slash, slash 40 years. But one of the most interesting th- things about the book is that you set Yellowstone in the context of what's going on in the United States after the Civil War. And I think, again, one of these preconceptions people have is that what's going on after the Civil War in the West is sort of a separate thing. It's not Reconstruction. It's not... It's being sort of left alone or it's being explored, but Washington itself, Washington, D.C. itself doesn't have its fingers in every detail. But again, reading the book, I learned new things. Yeah, this this was one of my driving questions going into the project, because when I first started thinking about writing a book about Yellowstone, so about 2018, I kind of come to it through my previous book, The Three-Cornered War, because I was doing research on surveying, because one of the protagonists in that book is a surveyor. And I was like, oh, right, Ferdinand Hayden, 1871 survey of Yellowstone, Mm -hmm. led to the Yellowstone Act. And I was like, oh, the 150th anniversary is coming up. Interesting. That, it's not the only reason to write a book, but it is a compelling reason, I think, for editors to say, oh, we're going to launch this book kind of in a in an anniversary year. Then I just kind of had to think about, well, how am I going to approach this topic in a way that is new and interesting? Because a lot of books have been written about Yellowstone, a yeah, lot of very yeah, good yeah. books. I, it really actually didn't take me very long. I kind of thought about it. And I was like, wait a minute, has anyone ever talked about the fact that this is 1871-72? It's like, Right at this, in the middle of Reconstruction, right as the U.S. Congress is prosecuting the KKK in the South, the economy is still a little bit unstable. Like, what? Why are they giving Ferdinand Hayden forty thousand dollars to go explore Yellowstone, and then why are they passing this unprecedented legislation? Like, this just seemed like kind of wild to me. And Heather Cox Richardson. And Elliot West had been arguing for quite some time, for 20 years at least, that the West matters in the history of Reconstruction. Yes. Uh, but somehow th- that has not really made a dent. Hmm. Um, no, it in, really hasn't. And it's surprising because those books no. are, are, are wonderful. Oh, those books are great. Mm-hmm. And they were groundbreaking in and of themselves. And and those two historians are major historians and have a profound effect on the field. But somehow... No one really took up this idea, either in Western history or in Reconstruction history. Yeah. You know, everything just really remained really siloed. So this, I thought, was one of my kind of jobs in the book, was to really put forward the idea and shore it up, this idea that Reconstruction was most certainly about the South and bringing the former Confederate states back into the Union and protecting Black civil rights. But it was also about the West, Mm -hmm. and it was about Indian land dispossession, and it was about legislating expansion and the technology to make that happen through railroads, and that this was actually part of the Republican Party's vision as well during Reconstruction. Well, let's start there in Washington, in in the Republican Party and the Republican administrations. Why do they give, was after all, a hell of a lot of money to Hayden to do this? First of all, please explain to the bus killers who he was. But then why do they give him this money to do it? Sure. So Ferdinand Hayden was this kind of scrappy scientist explorer. He Mm -hmm. had grown up in Massachusetts. He was a child of of poverty and divorce. He would had this really hard scrabble life. And so he was kind of a gunner and he was very competitive and very ambitious to the point of being really obnoxious. And (laughs) and so Hayden Hayden was one of these guys who- That that never happens in history, obnoxious men and forcing themselves onto the stage. Exactly, exactly. You either loved him or you hated him. And people were pretty equally divided. But- He kind of discovered this love for geology when he was at Oberlin College, and then he discovered that he had a real skill, which was collecting and categorizing fossils, which is, these are items that are extremely important to the the field of geology to establish different 
points in the timeline of the Earth's geo history. So he's producing these, he becomes part, this is how he starts to know people in the scientific field. And then, you know, he figured that his path to riches and fame was <laughs> to become a surveyor, someone who would go out with military expeditions and kind of get the lay of the land, quite literally, measuring it, collecting data, collecting specimens, and trying to figure out how the federal government or the state or territorial governments could actually use that land if they could develop it in any sort of way. So he started to do that in the 1860s. And, and by 1870, he was a U.S. geologist and he had led a couple surveys out into the West, most recently Wyoming. And he went to a talk given by this guy, Nathaniel Langford, who was a Montana, just kind of civil official, who had explored Yellowstone in the summer of 1870. Mm -hmm. And Hayden, true to form, not really interested, but also really panicked and a little angry and was like, I cannot let the amateurs take over. <laughs> I cannot let them claim Yellowstone. I have to get in there. I have to claim it for the federal government. I have to claim it for science and kind of take it out of the hands of these locals who don't know what they're doing. It, it's important to note that Yellowstone was really one of the last relatively unknown places oh, on, yeah, yeah. in the lo lower 48. He was interested in it in that way, too, as kind of scientific mind. And he convinced senators and, and congressmen to give him this money. I think he was able to do it because the Republican Party and all the things that it was doing during this period was really looking for projects that would unite the nation. Right, right. That would bring people together, would bring Northerners and Southerners together. And the federal government, you know, since Lewis and Clark had always had an interest in surveys mm -hmm. and kind of knowing what was out there. And George um, Washington and so, himself as a very young man was yes. a surveyor long before his everything else. Yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. And so, you know, this was kind of part of the American zeitgeist any, but anyway, and, and Hayden took advantage of that. And Congress gave him quite a lot of money to put together a team of 50 people, which was quite large. It was the oh, largest yeah. team he'd ever had in the field with him. And so he went in the summer of 1871. And do, does he have an advantage? He's already a U.S. geologist before yes. he applies for the money, right? Yes. Yeah. And and it's important to remember, he's one of kind of four prominent surveyors in this period. Yeah. Uh, John Wesley Powell, who listeners may have heard of, Clarence King and George Wheeler. Mm -hmm. And all of these guys, I mean, Wheeler was a military guy, but the other three, they were kind of like independent contractors. And their livelihood was based on these pitches that they would make to Congress. It was almost like they were applying for annual grants. They were pitching the government, they were getting the money, they were paying themselves, they were paying other people, going out, doing the work, and then producing a huge field report, turning it in, and then starting all over again, starting that process all over again. Because wow. there was no, at this point, there was no USGS. So all of these guys were just kind of on their own doing these explorations. And they were getting a lot of help, obviously, from the federal government. They were sponsored by them, but it really took a lot of individual energy mm -hmm. and really focus and devotion. And that was one of Hayden's great strengths, that he was able to do that. We should remind Buzz Killers that the USGS is the United States Geological Service. And it's, important, it's an important point because, as you say, and as you imply throughout the book, you know, this is the period before those major bureaucratic agencies develop. How, how do things then, then happen? I mean, does it, is it sort of this adventurous pack up and go sort of thing, or is it much more complicated than that? Well, once Hayden got the money, he got the money in March. And so he started, he had already started to write to people to see if they were free to join him, especially scientists who he trusted, the manager of his, his whole team, the person he thought who was the most valuable member of the team, Potato John Raymond, who was the cook. Mm -hmm. Which has got to be one and, of the best nicknames in world history. Oh, yeah. yeah right. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. So he was sort of gathering them together and making plans. And then the idea was that they were all going to convene in Omaha which was the terminus of the, the Union Pacific Railroad. And then they would they would go together, most of them. They would hire kind of packers and laborers and other people in Utah. But the scientists and other kinds of support staff that Hayden trusted would go from Omaha to Ogden, Utah, and then they would 
That part was by train, which was actually incredibly important because, and this was only possible, and I make this argument in the book that Mm -hmm. Yellowstone could not have been explored in this way really until after 1869 with the completion of the transcontinental. Right. Because the visitation window in Yellowstone, anyone who has been there knows this, is really only between late May and early September because otherwise you'll get snowed in. Mm -hmm. And if you're snowed in and... If you're snowed in today, it's kind of dicey. Like there's still not great cell coverage. You know, you're in the middle of nowhere. It would be a little difficult. And there are bison roaming around. But in the early 1870s, it was even more dire. You would likely die if you were caught out in Yellowstone in winter. Then that was the end of you and all of your plans. So to be able to get out there quickly, to make that first segment of the trip really fast was hugely helpful for Hayden. So they all got off at Ogden, then they started going north and went through Virginia City, which was a mining town, and then stopped off at Fort Ellis, which is outside where Bozeman is now, picked up some cavalry support, and then they went in through the northern entrance, and this was really the only entrance that was available to them uh, in the 1870s. Now Yellowstone has four different entrances, but you really couldn't get there <laughs> through those uh, at this time. So that northern entrance was the gateway. And they got into the park by, well, not into the park. It was not the park yet. But they got <laughs> into the basin by July and had about a month and a half to really fully explore it, which was pretty good before they had to kind of get out of there by early September. Okay, I think buzzkillers will probably be able to guess why they needed military support, but let's tell them anyway, and maybe there's, there's, there's more in the detail of getting military support than meets the eye. Yes. So as the federal government knew, as Hayden knew, as, as all Americans knew, this was Indian country. The Shoshone Bannock lived on the southwestern side of Yellowstone, the the Crow and the, Sh- and the Shoshone, uh, different bands of the Shoshone lived in the kind of northern side. And then there were the Lakota who claimed all of the land along the Yellowstone River Valley as, as, as soon as it kind of popped out of the Yellowstone Basin and went all the way to the Missouri. The Lakota in particular had been causing a lot of trouble for federal officials, for white migrants, um, for Indian agents since the early 1860s. And much of this resistance was led by Tatanka Iotake, or Sitting Bull, who really emerges in this period as a leader of the Hunkpapa Lakota. Mm-hmm. Well, we're going to devote so, the second half of the show, of this episode, to his part of the story. Right. He's one of the big three in the book. Yeah, He is, yes. And Hayden was worried that... They might run into resistance. They might run into Native peoples who would seek to push them off of their territory and turn them back from Yellowstone. So that is why the military personnel were with them. There was also some concern. There had been a lot of banditry along the roads in that area because of the gold mines in Mm. Montana. There was a lot of gold moving through that country and so a lot of thievery. So according to to many people at the time, the the stagecoach rides through Idaho going northward to Virginia City were just harrowing experiences because the the stagecoach drivers were driving so fast to try to avoid being robbed that they were just tossing people Yikes. All over the place. Yeah, stagecoach yeah. rides so, are not so nice on the mo- in the most calm circumstances, and then to go at speed is even <laughs> worse. Right. Yeah. So there were there were some dangers along that line. It didn't turn out to be anything. They saw some indigenous peoples from a distance, or they traded with them at the reservations that had already been set up around the borders, and that was it. There was a, a lot of worry, but. Really, overall, Mm -hmm. the Hayden expedition had very few problems on the road during this expedition. So were they able then to do the survey itself fairly completely, you know, and uh, on time and under budget and all that sort of stuff? Yeah, definitely within budget, definitely on time. They saw almost everything that they wanted to see. The upper and lower falls of the Yellowstone, the Grand Canyon of the Yellowstone, Yellowstone Lake, and then both ends of the geyser basins, the upper and the lower. And they went like from end to end, counting 
various hot springs, trying to, you know, take samples of everything. And the one thing that they did, the one feature they saw, which had not yet been recorded for Americans, was Mammoth Hot Springs, which uh, they called the White Mountain. They spent several days there on the front end and the back end of the trip, because to Hayden, this was his real discovery, because no one had ever really recorded its size or had described it. No, certainly no one had taken specimens from it before. And for scientists, that those kinds of things are really important. Oh, yeah. Before we go too far before the break, let's bring in the second major figure who you talk about, and that is a man named Jay Cook. What's his part in this yes. story? Yes, Jay Cook, another fascinating figure <laughs> from this era. He grew up in Ohio, figured out when he was a teenager that he had a head for numbers mm -hmm. and this really kind of uncanny understanding of business and how investments worked. And so he left school and started working as a clerk. And by the time he was 40, he was running his own investment bank. He made millions of dollars during the Civil War selling war bonds mm -hmm. to finance the U.S. war effort. And in the years after the war, he was really kind of searching around for a new project and one that would not only make him a lot of money, but one that would give him that same sense of patriotism that he had had during the Civil War. And he hit upon, of all things, the Northern Pacific Railroad, which well, kind of covers was both bases. A... It is an industrial investment, but also this yes. tying of the country together thing. Exactly. And the Northern Pacific, which was meant to connect the Great Lakes to the Pacific, was chartered as the Centennial Line. And mm -hmm. it was supposed to be finished in 1876 to celebrate the country's 100th birthday. And so it had that patriotic element to it. So he signed on in 1870 to raise money for the Northern Pacific. None of his banker buddies could believe it. Because everyone knew that railroads were terrible investments. Mm. They were really hard, right? Because oh, yeah, the way yeah, that, yeah. yeah, railroads were funded in this way where you had to build track in order to get paid in land. So how are you going to build the track? Well, you have to recruit investors. And if you can't recruit investors, the whole thing just comes to a stop. And he he was having a really hard time. So he became interested in Ferdinand Hayden. They had kind of known each other in Philadelphia from kind of social circles and art and science. He became interested in his expedition because he wanted his railroad track to go to run about 50 miles north of where Yellowstone Basin is. And he thought, well, this could be great. You know, we'll find out what's there. If it's a tourist attraction, then I can make money bringing tourists to Yellowstone. And then that will gin up a lot of excitement and interest and descriptions. And then migrants will want to come and settle. And then they will use the railroad, not only to travel, but to ship all of their goods. He thought this was great. So he let Hayden know that he was supportive of the, the expedition. He also paid the way of Thomas Moran, a painter from Philadelphia, to go and paint scenes that he would then, he was planning to use in his marketing for the Northern Pacific Railroad. Yeah. And then, of course, Moran did produce those for him. And then he also produced an amazing painting, The Grand Canyon of the Yellowstone, which we were able to get for the cover of the book, which right. is quite delightful. And, and by the way, because Buzz Killers, I, when these paintings are such a huge thing back East, and then more even, perhaps even more importantly, and you can correct me on this if I'm wrong, engravings created from those paintings and then published in newspapers and magazines, it, they were just, they were hoarded. It's a, a, a yeah. tremendous, tremendous public relations move, basically. Oh, yeah, abs absolutely. I mean, in the, in the time before radio and television mm. and film, you know, paintings and photographs and illustrations were the media through which Americans consumed visual images, right? And consumed images of other places. And so paintings and illustrations were, and then photographs in the years after the Civil War were incredibly important for shaping the whole idea of American landscapes and particularly Western landscapes during this period. So Moran was a pivotal figure, but he just, he sent Moran. He didn't tell Hayden he was going to do it. Moran just kind of showed up <laughs> in Idaho after taking one of those stagecoach rides, shows up with a letter of introduction 
And, you know, Hayden was never one to turn down a patron. So he was like, okay, welcome. I hope you can ride a horse (laughs) because if you can't, you're going to get left behind. Moran actually couldn't ride a horse, but he suffered through it uh, for for the rest of the survey and was able to produce these these really amazing images. Yeah, so Cook was was very interested in Yellowstone, in the outcome of the expedition. And it was actually his PR man who suggested to Hayden that Hayden kind of in his report of the expedition advocate for its designation as a national park. Well, this is a good time for us to take a little bit of a break, Buzz Killers, because we've talked about two of the three important people in in the book, and we want to talk, we want to devote the second half of the show mostly to the third one. So we're going to take a sponsorship break and bow to our corporate overlords, and we'll be back with Dr. Nelson and Saving Yellowstone in a moment. We are back, Buzz Killers, with one of the more important historians that I've interviewed in my long career as a podcaster, which is seven years as a podcasting. In podcasting, that is like being the author of the of the Bible. That's how uh, that's how sh- short podcasting life has been. Dr. Kate Nelson, who is, of course, talking with us about Saving Yellowstone, an extremely important book that you all need to read that's on the Buzzkill Bookshelf for you to get. Now, Dr. Nelson, before we left, we talked about Hayden and Cook. Uh, Hayden, the surveyor, Cook, the, one of the financiers of this project. Perhaps most importantly, there's a third person who you focus on in the book, who's, I think, largely been left out of the story, at least not elevated to the point those two Mm -hmm. others are. Please tell us about him. Yes, Tatanka Iotake, Sitting Bull, who was, by 1871, a war chief and a diplomatic leader and a religious leader of the Hunkpapa Lakota. He had really become, even by that point, a voice for his people, for Native sovereignty, And he had been leading the fight to prevent white settlement and white encroachment of Lakota lands already for many years. So Lakota lands extended from the Missouri River to the Yellowstone Basin. And the area along the Yellowstone River Valley was particularly important to the Lakota. I first ran into him actually through Jay Cook. So Mm -hmm. I knew that Jay Cook was going to be a major figure in the book. And then I was trying to figure out why Cook was having such a problem uh, with the Northern Pacific and with laying down track, even with his support of of Yellowstone. And it turns out that he had run up against one of the most powerful figures in 19th century America, this Lakota leader who was having none of it. He was not uh, about to kind of bow down to the federal government and to hand over his lands to them. Systematically, in 1871 and 1872, whenever Sitting Bull and whenever the Lakota spotted Northern Pacific surveyors out into, in the field trying to, to figure out where they were going to lay this track, they surveilled them, they followed them, sometimes they lit fires to push them out mm-hmm. uh, of the region, and then they engaged in battles with them right. in the summer of 1872 and prevented Cook from laying that track, which of course then prevented him from raising any money. And the whole enterprise really got scuttled. I became really interested in Sitting Bull's role in this moment, in his vision of the region that Cook referred to as the Great Northwest, which was really an area controlled by indigenous polities at that time. But this is an important moment for Sitting Bull. This is really one of the arguments I make in the book is that this is where you really see him rise up and and starts him on the road to the Battle of Greasy Grass or Little Bighorn, right. which is, I think, the, the action that most Americans associate with him. But I think you see the kind of origins of that fight start in this tussle with the Northern Pacific and their surveyors and their military escorts. And then also, I think this is an important moment in Lakota history in general uh, and in the history of the West, because this is when the federal government really amps up its efforts to force removal of indigenous peoples onto reservations throughout this region. How does he initially react to Hayden being out there, Cook trying to put these railroads through, et cetera, et cetera? Well, we don't actually know if Sitting Bull was aware of Hayden's expedition. We Mm -hmm. know that Hayden was 
very much aware of him. One of the routes to Yellowstone was actually to go up the Missouri River and then cross through Lakota country. But Hayden was not about to do that. So he was very happy to take the Union Pacific Railroad and go on the southern side and sort of avoid Sitting Bull and his people altogether. Yeah. And then ultimately also a little bit later in 1873, he wanted to go back. Hayden wanted to go back to Yellowstone that year. But the situation in that region along the Yellowstone River Valley was so fraught and so tense and was becoming so violent that he felt like he couldn't do it. So he took his survey to Colorado instead. Mm. Sitting Bull's presence is sort of shaping action around him, even though he's not even really doing anything. But the threat that he would do something was making change. But Sitting Bull did take action against the Northern Pacific because they actually were trying to move through Lakota territory. And they all knew, the indigenous peoples living in this area all knew what the railroad meant. They knew what roads meant, many of the treaties that had been made with tribal nations in this period, especially all of the treaties of 1868, had an element in them which said that the federal government could build any road through native land. And so they knew what that meant. This is the, exer- the the exertion of federal power. It is federal presence. And to them, it meant the beginning of the end. Mm-hmm. Sitting Bull was quite overt about, he would sometimes come to the negotiating table or he would send people as his proxies and and they would say, we know what this is. <laughs> yeah, you know, yeah, we're... Yeah, we're yeah. We know, we know exactly what this is, and we're not ab- about to let you build the Northern Pacific Railroad through our country. They negotiated, but they weren't really negotiating. They were saying, they were using the opportunity of the negotiating table to say to federal officials, basically, we're not going to let you pass through here. Because th- in the wake of a railroad, we know, come white settlers, and you will just take our land and destroy it. You will hunt all the bison, and we will no longer be able to live. From their position, they were just saying, you know, yeah, sure, we'll we'll make peace with you. Just don't come into our territory. <laughs> and and of course, the federal government and and Jay Cook and his his Northern Pacific surveyors basically ignored that hmm. and tried to do it anyway. And that sparked then some violent reprisals from Sitting Bull and his people. How then do those reprisals shape the way the park ultimately develops? Is it is is it a part where, where uh, Hayden has to say, well, we're going to have to just ignore this corner because it's too difficult to, if if you will, conquer mm-hmm. to, to include it in a park or even include in the survey? Well, what's interesting about Yellowstone proper, sort of what we know of now as the park, which is actually the second largest national park in the lower 48. Mm-hmm. It's 2.2 million acres. When it was initially preserved, it was only 1.1 million acres. So it was actually concentrated. It was concentrated in the geyser basins and then Yellowstone Lake and the canyon and the upper and lower falls. So it really kind of encapsulated that. And then it has grown over time. In the debates about the Yellowstone Act, actually, in the Senate, someone brought up, is this actually Lakota land? Is this land covered in any treaty? And the answer to that question was no. For an interesting reason, which is that there are 27 tribal nations that have historic ties to Yellowstone. Mm -hmm. The Lakota feature very prominently in the book because I chose Sitting Bull as a protagonist, but there were 26 other tribal entities that, that used Yellowstone in some way. They either used it as a thoroughfare to go back and forth between their homelands and the bison hunting lands of Wyoming and Nebraska, or they used it as a place to act, to hunt elk or bison during the winter. They also used it for ceremonies. They used it to gather medicines. And then there was one band of the Shoshone, the Chududeca, who lived up in the mountains in the western part of Yellowstone. They were called the sheep eaters because they would raise uh, mountain sheep, not the sheep you think of now, but like mountain sheep. They were fairly peaceful. They didn't give Hayden any trouble, although he was he was worried about that. So this was a kind of collective indigenous space, Mm -hmm. and many nations claimed it. 
but it had never been. And I think for that reason, it had never really been part of a treaty. I think the Crow had claimed part of Northeastern Yellowstone as their initial reservation in the early 1850s, but then that got sliced out in 1868. The question of whether or not it was indigenous land, the answer to that, and already under treaty, was no. Was it indigenous land? Of course it was. Yeah. The whole space was. And it was claimed as territory by many, many different groups. Of course, the congressman didn't care about that. As in most actions during this period of land taking, the federal government completely dismissed any Native arguments for sovereignty over their own homelands. This you can see as another example of the federal government making that assertion in this period. Mm -hmm. This is one of the reasons this book is so important. It does help us understand and give an example of these sorts of treaties and arrangements and put in quotation marks. Mm -hmm. How else does your research help us better understand that last third of the 19th century as, as a whole? There's so much going on here. There's Reconstruction, there's Reconstruction in the West, there's Native American relations, and on and on and on. And Washington becoming as a larger and larger bureaucracy. It's absolutely mm -hmm. fascinating, as I always say on the show, but it's just so amazing that so much can be drawn from one, and I don't mean that in an insulting small way, but one national, what eventually becomes one national park. I like to think about my any book topic really, or any historical event is kind of the center of an exploding star. It may just be a moment, but it has many, many different ramifications that just get bigger and bigger as you think about them. And I think when we look at Yellowstone from the vantage point of Reconstruction, and we when we think about Reconstruction from Yellowstone, it reveals a couple of interesting things. It reveals, first of all, that Reconstruction was obviously about the South, but it was also about the West. Mm. And that the federal government in this period was trying to bring all of these regions together. Yeah. In a lot of different ways. And there are projects in the West, Yellowstone Expedition, the Yellowstone Act, railroad building, forced removal of Native people. All of those were going toward the Republican Party's larger vision of the future for America that this was going to be a land of free, white, possibly black farmers, and that this was going to be the, the empire of liberty that Thomas Jefferson had imagined, mm. right? They also, the Republican Party in this period, is really flexing its muscle. It's really trying to see how far it can extend its reach in the South and in the West. So, you know, you have Ulysses S. Grant basically going after the KKK in the South as a kind of second Southern rebellion, just really crushing it <laughs> um, in that moment. And then you see in the West, the creation of this, this national park. And both of those moments, I think, also show us that higher ideal. We have this moment where the federal government is reaching for something higher. They're trying to do something good. They are trying to protect Black civil rights. They're trying to provide a place like Yellowstone for the benefit of the people in perpetuity. And unfortunately, what we also learned from that is this was really the APEC. The federal government did not come to the defense of Black Americans again until the 1960s. Right. And even then, it didn't do that great of a job. And even now, we're, you know, we're still in oh, it. Oh, sure, yeah. And then there was this huge time lag, as we discussed in the beginning, between the first national park and then the, the kind of second and then the third major phase. There was a real lag. Even now, because of the nature of the Antiquities Act and the importance of executive power in creating sites other than national parks, but national historic sites and battlefields, things like that, it's totally up to the president. Yeah, that's amazing. And, and we saw this. Yeah, we saw this during the Trump administration. He was trying to dismantle many areas, including Bears Ears and Grand Staircase Escalante in the Southwest to give them over to, to mining concerns for that kind of development. And he could have done that. It was, it was perfectly, it was horrible, but perfectly legal yeah. for him to do that under the Antiquities Act. So we learn all of that about federal power and about its limits and what happens when our politicians in Washington actually start to, to take a bigger view of things. How are we actually going to do this? 
Then we also learn that the history of national parks is always going to be a history of native land dispossession. Right. And that that's just a fact. We just have to to reckon with that and find a way forward. You know, I think a lot of people, not not academics, I think academics are like, okay, yes. <laughs> like that yeah, doesn't, sure. they're like, okay, like I could see how that would be, right? If they didn't know about it before. I get a lot of comments from public audiences and general readers. If I get criticism, it's it's often, why are you destroying national parks for me? Why yeah, are you telling is... me this like dark history? Of the yeah, parks? yeah. Well, yeah, yeah. I can, I can imagine and, that. Well, and what I say to that is, I know all of the the dark parts of this history, and I can still go to Yellowstone yeah. and stand in front of the lower falls and just stare at it with wonder. Yeah. You know, and I can still appreciate the bison herds walking on the road and and the mud pots, which are my favorite part of Yellowstone, mm-hmm. all of the mud volcanoes. And I can still enjoy those. I don't think that knowing history takes away from your experience of sublime landscapes. I think it actually enhances it to kind of know that history and to fully understand what's happened in that place. Well, I can imagine a better way to to wrap up the show that, that knowing the history helps appreciate almost yeah. everything. And this is certainly one of those cases. So it just remains for me to say thank you, Dr. Nelson, so much for coming on the show. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. This has been a great conversation. Well, I'm glad. I'm glad. I've, I've certainly learned more than I ever knew before. And Buzzkillers, again, Saving Yellowstone is on the Buzzkill bookshelf. Please go get it right away. By the way, is there an audio book? There is an audio book okay. and an ebook. Okay. Well, we're going to put all three of them on there because I've, I have been realizing one of the great innovations in audiobook stuff that is more serious history books are being turned into audiobooks I think than ever before. Yes. So we're going to put all three yes. three versions on on the Buzzkill bookshelf. So please go get it. Please go to professorbuzzkill.com, sign up for the free newsletter where you get our episodes, support us on Patreon if you can, and of course please rate and review us on your favorite podcast platforms, uh, Apple Podcasts especially that makes a huge difference in gaining attention for the show. Again, Dr. Nelson, this has just been wonderful. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Joe. Buzzkillers, we will talk to all of you next week.